Okay, <clears throat> democracy and religion. This is the lecture that you should quote from if you want to alienate anyone you are on a first date with. Uh, politics, religion, um, sexual orientation may come up uh, given the debates about gay marriage. Who knows? It's all sorts of things you can't talk about at polite dinner parties. Let's jump in. So, the big issue really is what to do about the interface, the interaction, um, sometimes the confrontation, sometimes the connection between democracy and religion and between the demands of the values that both inculcate. And initially, especially, I think especially if you're coming from an American background, from a US background, initially it might seem that this is mostly a conflict. This is mostly a problem for a few reasons. Democracy fundamentally is supposed to be about people governing themselves, people creating their own rules, their own reasons, and living by only the things they've chosen for themselves. Religion is all about transcendent values. Religion is specifically about the things that are, at least in most of its traditional forms, religion is about things that are beyond this world, beyond human choice, uh, beyond the agreements that we make with each other. Uh, this might actually be a good point for, uh, for a little bit of an aside. Throughout this, I'm going to be talking about religion very generally. And of course, religion comes in lots and lots of forms. The kinds of religions that have most bothered folks in the democratic and political philosophy tradition, given that lots of the folks that we're talking about are from Western cultures, they tend to be the um, more traditional, theistic, metaphysical, straightforward, often Judeo-Christian um, religions, or Abrahamic religions, I guess. Nussbaum, of course, talks a bit about Hinduism. Uh, certainly, there's a long tradition that I am utterly ignorant of in Chinese political thought uh, about Confucianism. Um, other kinds of religions influence folks. Uh, and there's a wide variety even within the way that people within sort of the religions that are the mainstream religions around here think of religion. Um, I worked, for instance, for a professor, I promise the story is at least marginally relevant. I worked, for instance, for a professor once when I was in graduate school who was known to be a devout Catholic, um, in fact was quite popular among the conservative Catholic students that would get directed to his class since he had high teaching recommendations and was sort of openly religious. But if you asked him about religion, if you asked him what he meant when he said that he believed strongly in the resurrection of Christ and this sort of thing, it turned out that what he meant was not quite what a lot of Christians meant. You know, he would he was a student of Derrida, um, and you know, he would tell you these stories about how religion is about making a fundamental existential choice about whether the universe makes sense or doesn't make sense, and it's all about the metaphors that we choose to organize our experience as limited beings and this sort of thing. Right. This is very different from the famous Christian philosopher Peter van Inwagen, who was reported to have been at a conference of uh, Christian philosophers, and after hearing many postmodernist Derrida influenced, it's all about the metaphor that you use to organize your life kind of presentations, stood up to give his talk and uh, is, is said to have said, look, I've been hearing a lot of stuff this weekend, and um, I don't understand a lot of it. When I say that I'm a Christian, I believe that if you set up a video camera outside the tomb, you would see Jesus roll the rock away and walk out. So even within religion, there's a wide variety of things. And of necessity, some of the things that I will say will not apply to every possible variety of religion there might be. All right, so caveat aside. Point one, democracy is about people governing themselves. Religion, in many of its forms, is fundamentally about people being governed by things outside of themselves. Democracy, as we talk about in the citizenship lecture, is, at least on many conceptions of it, about 
a system in which people make decisions based on giving reasons for their choices that everyone in the polity can understand and share. When you're engaged in a democracy, for a lot of thinkers, an important part of what you should be doing is appealing to your co-nationals on a level that they can accept, giving them reasons that make sense to them. But religious reasons, at least for a lot of religions, are often available only to believers. They're based on revelation sometimes. They're based on direct spiritual experience. They may be based on the authority of religious leaders. This is the sort of problem where, for instance, if you are a Catholic, at least if you're a sort of traditional, straightforward Catholic, you consider the authority of the Pope on religious matters, not on everything, on religious matters, the authority of the Pope is absolute. The Pope says that it's true on religious matters. I, as a non-Catholic, have no particular reason to believe that. I don't take the Pope said it as any kind of reason to believe anything, religious or not. Um, religious reasons are often fundamentally inaccessible to non-believers. Um, Christianity, of course, is not the only religion that has this kind, has this kind of feature. I mean, um, many religions have either things that you are expected to believe because they are in canonical books or canonical stories, or have some kind of direct contact with the divine as an important part of this. It says true of, you know, transcendental neo-pagan yoga as it is of Christianity. Not all are like this, but it's an important part of many of them. And related to these two, democracy is often thought of by its defenders as fundamentally being about personal liberty. Democracy is a system of government that many people consider to be set up fundamentally to protect your ability to live your life the way that you want. And at least in its liberal incarnations, um, which is many of them, uh, part of the idea is often that no one is in a position to tell you what the good life is better than you are. But of course, most religions, many religions, uh, believe in an absolute truth. Religion is often about there being a single kind of life that is good for human beings. Um, it's not just a system that says, well, you know, we're here to try to let you live whatever kind of life that you want. All right, so that's kind of the, the, the core of the apparent confrontation or tension between religion and democracy. Democracy is about self-governance, public reason, and personal freedom. Religion is very often about some form of transcendent, transcendental governance, parochial, restricted reasons, and submission to absolute truth. But, of course there's a but. This would be a very boring discussion if there wasn't a but. Democracy isn't just about doing whatever the majority of people want, right? This is why we have the whole discussion of citizenship, and of con this is why we have a constitution in the U.S. This is why other countries have basic laws. Democracies also have fundamental values. Slide says constitutional, read it with a small c. Not every place has a constitution, but most democracies have some kind of core protected values. Some set of core values that are not open to whatever people want them to be. They are not open to whatever people choose for themselves. They are not open to um, even often public, even perfectly public discussion. They are very resistant to that sort of thing. Um, and in many cases, U.S. Constitution, no exception, they're considered to flow in some way from fundamental truths about morality or fundamental truths about human nature, right? The Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution is not just what we happen to agree on. Most defenders of the Bill of Rights, though they wouldn't necessarily put it this way, a great number of defenders of the Bill of Rights, certainly the drafters of it, thought that these needed to be there because it was just true that human beings have these kinds of rights, human human life had these kinds of values embedded in it, and there's no immediately obvious reason why you couldn't have a democracy that functions like a democracy, but at least these kinds of protected values are derived from a religious source rather than from a non-religious source. And this is the this is the angle that many defenders of incorporating religion into democratic systems uh, will use. All right, so there's at least three basic kinds of approaches 
that polities can take to try to reconcile the presence of religion, the religiosity of individuals in the system um, with the democratic values of the system itself. Uh, don't waste too much time worrying about the jargon. This is me trying to slap a label on three very broad families of approaches. And of course, remember that in terms of specific policy, there's lots of lots of variations on these, but there are three kind of 60,000 foot overview approaches to the issue. So the first one is separation of church and state. Um, this is an American term. I believe it comes from Jefferson originally. Um, we can argue about whether or not this was the original intent of the framers of the Constitution, uh, but this is de facto at least basically the strategy that the U.S. has pursued and other countries um, pursue this kind of strategy as well. <clears throat> Pardon me. So if you have a separation of church and state strategy, uh, what you do is you have the state the state has no official religion. The state does not establish an official religion, um, and it does its darndest not to favor any religion over another, and often, uh, certainly in the U.S., uh, this is considered part of it, not to favor religiousness over non-religiousness, um, or, or anything like that. Um, political decisions, when you have separation, are not to be made on a religious basis. Uh, this can be tricky, because... On the one hand, the idea is that you want political decisions to be made separately from religion so that they don't represent the dominance of one religion over another. On the other hand, in most separation style democracies, it's not necessarily a problem for, say, an individual legislator to make a decision on a religious basis, as long as they do it within the democratic forms. This is often a very gray area. Um, things get even grayer when you talk about something like, well, what if an individual legislator, legislator makes a decision based on the sanctity of human life? The idea that human life is especially morally important looks like a public kind of reason. It looks like the kind of reason that people from a variety of different religious traditions could at least understand and accept as a meaningful reason, even if they don't agree with the way it's being used. But the individual might believe in the sanctity of human, of human life because of their religious beliefs. So it can be really fuzzy what we mean to say that they're not made on a religious basis. And then, of course, in most democracies, individual voters are under no obligation whatsoever to give any sort of reasons for, uh, for their decisions. So if I go into the polling booth and vote for the person who shares my religion uh, because they share my religion, as long as they then go and act as a, uh, a responsible legislator, it's not clear whether or not I've done anything wrong. Some kinds of citizenship theorists will say that I have, because everyone ought to operate on the basis of public reasons, but that's not actually the way most people regard it in, um, in contemporary democracies, right? Most people in the United States, for instance, don't think that it's wrong, it's inherently wrong for someone to vote for somebody based on religious reasons. Um, even, even folks who are worried about people who are who are the representatives acting directly from religious religious reasons. So part of what's actually really messy in general about the separation of church and state strategy is that it's frankly it's really hard to separate them. Um, it's really hard to tell people whether they're voters or legislators or presidents or whoever that okay when you enter the public sphere you turn off the religious part of things. Um, people would typically be influenced by it even if they're not directly drawing on it. Um, and so there's inevitably going to be lots of arguments about how much influence is too much and that sort of thing. Okay, an important correlate of this, so the flip side of religion staying out of the public sphere in a separation of church and state model is that religion is given fairly free reign within the private sphere. So one thing, just as a note, keep in mind, the separation strategy requires a pretty strong division between the public and private spheres. 
you need both uh, in order to make this work. And you need it to be an, uh, a relatively impermeable barrier. Uh, and some of the things that we've, we've talked about with respect to critiques of the public-private disti distinction apply to this as well. If you, if it's, if you can't make a public-private distinction, making a separation of church and strategy, separation of church and state strategy work is going to be difficult at best. Um, but within that private sphere, generally speaking, in the separation model, individuals have as close to unlimited religious freedom as possible. You can have whatever religion you want, you can get together, you can practice your religion, um, there are no laws saying you can't. Um, the government is expected to, as far as possible, not place any burdens on your practice of, the re of, of your own religion. Um, that sort of thing can't be social discrimination against you based on the uh, on your religion. Um, these are all things that are part of the the separation strategy. However, one thing to keep in mind is that in most countries that follow this, um, and this can be problematic, but in most countries that follow this, it is often understood that laws of general applicability may still trump freedom of religion. Uh, to take a silly example, most countries that follow the strategy wouldn't say, well, all right, look, in your religion, human sacrifice is practiced, so I guess you guys are exempt from the laws against murder. Um, most most countries and most people think it's reasonable, would say, no, 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 all right, the laws against murder, murder are of general applicability. It doesn't matter if your religion says it's okay to murder, you can't do it. Um, grayer areas are things like uh, drug use or animal sacrifice. You know, uh, I had a, an acquaintance who lived in Israel who would complain about uh, some of her neighbors uh, killing chickens in the, you know, basically on the sidewalk in front of the house. Uh, and, you know, you might say, well, on the one hand, mm, killing animals for religious reasons, many people find that kind of sketchy. On the other hand, you know, we kill animals for meat eating. So, uh, should that be the kind of thing that's restricted? Drug use is another sort of thing that that has come up certainly in the in the U.S. Um, should Native Americans be allowed to uh, use peyote for religious purposes? Should Rastafarians be allowed to use marijuana for religious purposes? Uh, so there are questions about. And this, again, is sort of the, the other side of the messiness of the public-private divide. If I am using drugs for religious purposes in my own home, is that something that should be part of the private sphere that's protected as part of religious freedom? Or is drug use inherently a public problem and so regulated and, you know, something that religious reasons should not get involved with? All right. A different way of going is a kind of aggressive secularism. Um, this is a kind of strategy where you don't just separate out religion from politics, but allow religion to flourish on its own turf, but you actually try to control or even to some extent suppress religion or some kinds of religion, even in the private sphere. Some states uh, pursue this explicitly. Uh, Turkey has a explicitly secularist policy. Uh, it's actually been interesting to see how it evolves. Uh, Turkey, of course, has, has long been a uh, predominantly Muslim country, though uh, Ataturk, who founded modern Turkey and the army, see themselves as the guarantors of the secularism of the state. Uh, and there's been interesting evolution and confrontation over that. And it's implicitly followed by some other states. So, for instance, France. Uh, it's not as if in France religion is extirpated, but Fran France has policies that would likely raise hackles as violations of freedom of religion in the U.S. Uh, they, they, they consider it a legitimate policy position to promote a kind of secularism, not just to keep hands off of religious, uh, religious issues. So, in most secular states like this, at least the modern ones, the contemporary ones, religion's not usually legally restricted. It's usually not a, a matter of saying that you can't practice your religion, but the state itself is oriented towards inculcating secular values. So there's not a pure freedom of religion involved the way that the separation strategy aspires to. Often, uh, this is one of the, the, the main ways that it manifests uh, 
used to manifest this way in, in Turkey, though there's been re relaxation of that. Uh, political parties with a religious bent will be banned or discouraged. Um, and certain kinds of displays of religion may be restricted. So, for instance, the headscarf bans in, uh, in France. So, there have historically been states that have been even more aggressively restrictive than this. Uh, my again, I'm ignorant of China. My understanding is that China has been softening its stance, but China um, has pursued more aggressively secularist uh, positions against, uh, at least against some religious groups. Uh, the Soviet Union was quite aggressively secularist. Nowadays, um, countries that follow a line like this tend to be a lot less aggressive in their aggressive secularism, but it's still a difference. The difference between this and the separation strategy, even though nowadays you won't likely find heavy restrictions in either place, is that secularist countries take it to be a legitimate purpose of the state to promote secular values uh, in the state in a way that separation states don't. Um, for a separation of church and state strategy, secular values like religious values are one more position that is neither to be promoted nor to be suppressed uh, in the state. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got a third approach which you might call uh, religious constitutionalism. Despite the infamous secularism of Europe, uh, this is actually a fairly common approach in Europe, the UK. Uh, being one example, and it is often presented as an approach that is especially favorable for states with large Islamic populations that, that want to be democracies. So this is basically the approach that is being pursued with U.S. support in Iraq and Afghanistan right now. So <clears throat> if you've got a religious constitutionalist order, uh, Iran would probably also count as a kind of religious constitutionalism. Um, if you have a religious constitutionalist order, it's sort of what it sounds like. You have religious values embedded into the constitutional structure of a democracy. So, as I said before, most democracies take it that there is some bedrock of principles, values, rights, laws, procedures, whatever, that are not subject to direct or at least easy direct democratic majoritarian control. They structure the system. Religious constitutionalist orders try to square the circle of combining religion and democracy by embedding religious values directly into the constitutional structure, whether it be a, a constitution or a basic law or whatever. So in these kinds of orders, you have an established religion alongside democratic government. So, like in Iran, you have the ayatollahs, and then you have the elected government. In Iraq and Afghanistan, the system that's developing is one where you have um, an establishment of Sharia law as a source of law alongside a democratic legislature and those sorts of forms that are more familiar to Western forms of law. In these kinds of systems, Religious values may be openly used to constrain or shape legislation. Typically, um, the invocation of religious values by a leader is no big deal. Um, and there may even be procedures or structures in place by which legislation passed through the democratic method is subject to religious constraint or religious review. Um, Iran, to the best of my understanding, has a fairly robust version of this. Iraq and Afghanistan have a lesser one. Um, many European countries, I believe, have this sort of on the books, though it's not typically used uh, anymore. But the idea is that the same way that the Supreme Court in the United States could say that, you know, the individual insurance mandate is invalid because it's unconstitutional, in a state that follows a, a, a strategy of religious constitutionalism, you might say that some other piece of legislation is invalid because it violates religious values. It violates Sharia law, or it violates church canon, or whatever the relevant uh, religious code is. Um, so, a similar kind of system. And 
the ideal would be that in the same way that a country like the United States tries to strike a balance between giving the people what they want through the legislature and protecting fundamental values through the Supreme Court, a religious constitutionalist order would try to strike a balance between the democratic elements of the system and maintaining the core religious values built into the system itself. A couple things to note about this. One is that, again, at least in its contemporary forms, most states that follow the strategy typically are not terribly interested in stamping out all other religions. There are, of course, um, issues with this. Baha'i in Iran um, I make credible claims of being persecuted. Uh, it may be less comfortable to be a Christian or a Jew in a country that is uh, bound by Sharia law or a Muslim in a country that's bound by Christian law. Um, but most countries that follow this kind of model, typically you are allowed to practice whatever religion you want, at least in principle, but the values of the established religion are the ones that dominate the legislature. The other thing is that in Europe, where this is sort of widespread, one of the things is, ironically, this is actually tended, this is often understood to be uh, a source of religious apathy and secularism among the population. Uh, you know, so in the UK, you have an established church, Church of England. Um, it's funded by the government, has various government protections. The British are not notoriously religious. Uh, and it's a very common argument to say, well, look, when you make um, when you make religion part of the government, this just makes people cynical about religion the same way they're cynical about the government. Uh, and so this is actually, though religious constitutionalism is a strategy that is favored by many religious people, there are also other religious folks um, who worry about it. And in fact, historically, in the writings of folks like Locke, who you should have read, um, Locke was at least as worried about protecting religion from the government through separation as he was about protecting the government through, from religion. Uh, so there is a, um, the separation theory is separation strategies are driven often in part by a fear of contaminating religion and the secular trend of, of the European religious constitutional orders uh, is you know it, it's evidence in favor of that kind of concern. All right. One of the, the big issues that comes up with this is why anyone would favor freedom of conscience. This might seem a little bit weird from an American uh, context where we take freedom of conscience and freedom of religion to be a fundamental sort of thing. But remember, back at the beginning, we said one of the issues was that religion makes claims to absolute truth. Uh, and very often we you know, we might think that the cure would be worse than the disease to try to force anyone to believe true things in a really overt manner, but we also often don't think that we ought to give special protection to people who believe false things, right? I mean, think about debates over um, over the teaching of evolution in elementary schools, right? Um, both sides of the argument, <laughs> it's not as if the folks who want to teach creationism or intelligent design or, or, or what have you alongside of or instead of evolution want to do that because of a right to be wrong, right? It's not as if they're saying, look, creationism is clearly false, but we have no right to try to teach our children only true things, right? That would just be bizarre to say that. So in general, we don't, we, we don't in general think that people have a right to believe false things. Um, at least in a strong way, right? You don't put a gun to their head and make them believe something true, but we don't in general believe that the government should protect their false beliefs or teach false beliefs along with true ones in the school and that sort of thing. So, you know, why freedom of, of conscience about religion? Presumably, unless you are the postmodernist, Derridian, uh, religious relativist, presumably religion is either true or false, right? Either when I die, I'm going to have to answer for my sins before the judgment of Ma'at in the underworld, or, you know, my, my copy of the Egyptian Book of the Dead was a waste of $10, right? Either um, this world is all there is, and when we die, we turn into dust, or 
Christ is risen and we will all live forever through him, right? One of the, at most one of these things is true. So why is it that religion is, is, is special? It can't just be that there's disagreement on it because there's disagreement about a lot of things, right? There's disagreement about science. There's disagreement about economics. Um, and again, normally all we think is that this means that you shouldn't force anyone to believe something. Right? You shouldn't put a gun to their head and make them do it. But we don't think that this justifies the kind of approach that the U.S. and a lot of other countries follow towards religion, where we, say, where we actively protect and promote people's ability to believe in a plurality of religious views you know, and non-religious ones. Um, so, why freedom of conscience? There's a couple of reasons. One is that even for the religious folks, and you see this very heavily in Locke, um, even though it's something that's not talked about as much in the modern debates, coerced religion is inauthentic and worthless. So for a lot of religious thinkers, um, proselytizing, trying to convince you, trying to give you reasons to follow the religion, that's all great, but anything where state power would certainly if it would force you to follow a religion or even where it would make you make it massively inconvenient for you to follow a different religion this actually threatens the 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 the, the authenticity of religious experience not all religions worry about this the same way but c certainly for instance um the abrahamic religions uh, especially christianity and islam that are evangelical religions worry about this sort of thing judaism doesn't really seek converts so it's got a different traditional attitude but um Typically, at least for, for most of Christian theology, for instance, it, it doesn't count if someone is only going to church because they have to go to church to get social services, or if they don't go to church, you know, they get fired from their job or whatever. That doesn't count. The other side of it is that um, religion, and this is something that Nussbaum thinks that liberal thinkers don't often pay enough attention to. Nussbaum counts herself as a liberal, but she thinks that often people who share her basic liberal approach don't pay enough attention to this. Is that religion a significant source of value in people's lives? It just is the case that for most religious people, re the religion they follow shapes their life and their identity in a way that, for instance, um, the economic theory that I believe in doesn't for almost anyone who has an economic theory they believe in, right? Maybe, you know, some super hardcore libertarians or, you know, whatever, their economic views are such a part of how they think of themselves, but that's, that's pretty rare, right? Um, Keynesian, Keynesian economists versus, you know, Freiburg school economists, typically, you know, this doesn't play the same role in their lives that religion plays in people's lives. Um, similarly for lots of other things that people disagree on. So it is often thought that even if it is the case that at most one religious view can be true, and the state in general has no particular reason to support people's ability, you know, right to be in error. Religion's special because of the special role that it plays in people's lives, because it's so important to people's self-identity and to, and to their lives being meaningful. Um, and here it stands alongside certain other kinds of things that, that, we, that we often think of in this way. So at least in the US, we often think of marriage or the choice to have children as playing a similar kind of role that needs to be protected, um, a plurality of views on it, a plurality of models um, need to be protected, or alternatively, right, um, this is exactly the same reason why some people who think that there should not be a plurality of models of religion that are acceptable um, are so invested in their not being, right? Um, people who want Christianity, for instance, to be given a special status in American politics that Hinduism or Rastafarianism or Raelianism or Judaism or whatever doesn't have, it's simply because of how important it is to people's self-identities in building their lives that they want to do this. All right, of course, there's a but. Um, one is that freedom of conscience, an, an important part of, so part of the reason you want to have freedom of conscience is to allow people to have these religious identities that often involve religious community 
uh, that give shape and meaning to people's lives. But in its strongest form, an important part of freedom of conscience is the freedom to leave a religious community, right? So um, the way that we understand this, for instance, in the United States and in a lot of places that have similar models, it's, freedom of conscience doesn't just mean that the state will not pass a law saying you can't be a Mormon or whatever, right? It also means that the state has a legitimate interest in intervening if the Mormons or the Moonies or the Raelians or the Rastafarians or whoever don't want to let you leave. Um, the state can intervene to make sure that people know about other religions, right? Um, and that people have the freedom to choose another religion against their co-religionists, not just against the state. But one of the concerns is that protecting that element of religious freedom can in fact undermine the communities and might in fact undermine the, the values that they're serving in lives. Remember back to when we talked about the communitarians, part of what a lot of communitarians think is important about community in that sense is that it's not simply something that we choose because we like it. It's identity forming in a deeper, in a deeper kind of way. So a nation that promotes an image of religion as something that everyone should choose for themselves based more or less on what they like, not something that it is legitimate for communities to protect and have rules about uh, who's allowed in and who's allowed out, that might undermine some of the value, is the concern. The flip side of this is going back to this issue about generally applicable laws. There's a deep question about how far freedom of conscience should be allowed as a reason to ignore or violate laws. Um, obviously, right now as I'm recording this, there's a controversy about provision of contraception and abortion under this. Should pharmacists who um, believe that contraception is immoral be required to give contraception to people who come in? Should employers who believe abortion is immoral be required to pay for insurance that offers abortion coverage? Um, on the flip side of this, you have uh, issues like, um, you know, several states have passed laws requiring doctors to perform ultrasounds to give various kinds of information about uh, the fetus to women who are considering an abortion. Should doctors who believe that abortion is perfectly fine and a perfectly moral and acceptable choice in many circumstances, should they be allowed to not raise the issues that a lot of other people think are important? Um, and things can get really dangerous in this territory because, of course, there are many kinds of policies to which someone is going to object on uh, freedom of conscience or freedom of religion kinds of grounds. Uh, a lot of the recent discussion in the U.S. Has focused, over, has focused on reproductive rights and issues and issues of homosexuality, uh, this kind of private morality sort of stuff that has a relatively uh, a relatively small point of contact with large public issues. But take something like warfare, right? Um, the U.S., like many countries, has long had uh, rules for conscientious objection to serving in the military. But it's only relatively recently, for instance, in, in, in the U.S. and in a lot of other places, that you can have a non-religious uh, conscientious, conscientious objector status. But then what about the participation of all the rest of us, right? It's one thing to say, okay, it's a relatively small number of people for whom the issues of con issue of conscientious objection is going to come up. Um, and especially now where the U.S. and a lot of other Western countries have, have more or less all volunteer militaries, right? If you don't believe in serving the military, you just don't, don't sign up. Um, but if I object to some war that the U.S. is fighting, well, my tax money still goes to it. Do I get to say I have religious reasons against war, so therefore I'm not going to pay my taxes, or I'm not going to pay that part of my taxes? Um, 
you know, there are all sorts of policies from which people might seek religious or moral exemption. And it's a really finicky question to try to say exactly how far they should be allowed to get those exemptions. Um, so, you know, for instance, in the U.S., on the basis of freedom of conscience, we have this thing called the Hyde Amendment. It's actually now incorporated into the new uh, health care law, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken. So for many years, we had a thing called the Hyde Amendment that prevented federal funding uh, going to abortions. Right. So if you're on the military's uh, health care, if you were on Medicaid or, well, it probably wouldn't come up for Medicare, but uh, typically. But if you're on Medicaid, if you're on military health care, if you're on, you know, some sort of government uh, employee health care, uh, typically there would not be, you would not be able to use that money for abortions or a number of workarounds and this sort of thing. But, and the idea behind the Hyde Amendment, Henry Hyde put it in, was that many taxpayers object to abortion. Therefore, even if the Constitution says it's a private matter, we can't have a law preventing abortion, we should not have any federal funding going to abortion. Because then, if I'm against abortion, one of my tax dollars might go to pay for an abortion. It's immoral to expect me expect that of me. It violates my freedom of conscience. But, especially if you if you look at it this way, there's a, this raises huge problems. It raises the, what if I don't want my dollars going to the war? It raises the, what if I want, don't want my dollars going to whatever, foreign aid, welfare, um, agricultural subsidies. Uh, you know, where does the, where, where do we draw the line on what kinds of opt-outs from generally applicable laws and rules and responsibilities individuals are allowed to take? I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> Just go home and think about it. All right. So, so far we've talked a lot about the tension between democracy and religion and some of the ways to navigate that and um, some of the concerns about contamination of the one by the other either way. <clears throat> but maybe democracy needs religion. There's a long tradition, actually, of thinking that despite the apparent tensions, religion is actually quite supportive of democracy. And, and there are some folks, uh, I mentioned Huntington in class, um, McIntyre, a lot of the communitarians fall into this kind of category. I mentioned Dewey in class. Dewey was himself uh, atheist and, uh, you know, very much uh, uh, in the liberal tradition, but thought that we need to create a kind of quasi-religion in order to bind the community together. Uh, you know, it wouldn't be a God-focused one, but it would have many of the trappings of religion. So maybe actually, uh, you know, the, the one response to all the tension is say, well, well, great, good riddance to religion. But the flip side is that there might actually be a lot of value that religion can bring to a democratic system. And this is why people have argued for trying to navigate the thing. Um, one thing, purely historically, Tocqueville, other early commentators, noted the extreme religiosity of the U.S. And there are people who think that the very religious nature of the population in the United States has been part of the U.S.'s success as a democracy. There are lots of theories about why that may or may not be the case, but it is hard to... It is hard to be completely sanguine about the idea that religion and democracy are in conflict when one of the, you know, for whatever its flaws, one of the longest running democratic systems has been the U.S., despite the fact that Americans are quite religious compared to our peers in a lot of other countries, especially a lot of other uh, wealthy nations. So what might religion do? One thing, and, and Feldman talks about this a lot in, when he, in, in terms of uh, trying to characterize the support for Islamic states, is one thing is that religion might check corruption. Um, it might, you know, we, we talked about with respect to citizenship, <clears throat> this idea that maybe institutions alone are not enough. Maybe you need a certain degree of virtue among the citizenry and among the legislators in order to make the system actually work properly. And religion might provide a sort of internal check on the kinds of venality that would undermine the system. There might be no way to prevent people from spending a lot of money on political campaigns. 
or there might be no way for to prevent a legislator from taking money and then legislating in the interests of the person who gave it to him or her. But it's arguable that maybe if they have a strong core of religious values, they will prevent themselves from doing it. They will not as easily give in to the temptation. Uh, whether this is because they've internalized the norms or they fear punishment or, you know, they fear supernatural punishment or whatever. But um, there's this sort of thing. There is a... Well, this is something that, that is often a matter of dispute and quite acrimonious dispute between religious and non-religious people. But many religious people, not without not without reason, think that people who are religious will be more moral, will be less corrupt. Um, and this can be this can be a quite persuasive argument. Feldman thinks that um, you know a lot of the support for Islamic law in uh, in the Arabic speaking world comes from a perception that the the secularized leaders have been massively corrupt, and Islamic leaders, by comparison, are um, are at least not cor- are at least uncorrupt. Right? You may not agree with Sharia law, but you don't think they're taking kickbacks for it. Uh, Places in Africa where I've talked to people about corruption, where they, they, you know, there are a lot of people who see corruption as fundamentally a moral issue and one that needs to be. Um, Kwame Geshe, the Ghanaian philosopher, talks about how, in order to get rid of corruption in Africa, there needs to be a more an internal moral revolution. No institution will be able to do it, and he, you know, uh, is is. He actually thinks that African traditional cultural values will do it, but there are others who think that Christian values uh, will do it. A different kind of way that religion might support democracy is it might provide, as I mentioned a moment ago, it might provide the common basis of values that especially communitarians think you need in order to make the system operate properly. Democracy can have a tendency to pull people apart since it is it includes spaces for people to argue about things, um, to try to get their way, it is inherently pluralistic. Having some commonality of religion, it could be argued, might provide the kind of glue that keeps a democracy from completely coming apart at the seams. And again, this is um, this is very communitarian in spirit, this kind of concern, but it also goes to this, just this issue that there is a kind of balancing act in any democratic system between letting people do their own thing, letting people have freedom and liberty, and having a coherent system that can pursue the common good. Possibly a more specific form of the corruption issue is that religious institutions might sort of balance certain kinds of political power. I talked about this a bit when we talked about small-r republicanism. Republican theorists in general think that it's good to have multiple institutions that are at cross purposes. This prevents anyone from getting too powerful. Even if it's not directly a matter of something like corruption or venality, if any one institution becomes too powerful, you know, power corrupts. It has a tendency, even if you don't become selfish or immoral, it has a tendency to blind you to things that that, that are necessary to consider. Uh, concentrating power has a tendency to um, allow groups to become tyrannical uh, just because there's no one who has an alternate perspective that can that can that can drive it home. So religious institutions might be this kind of balance in some cases. Uh, again, this is something that Feldman claims is a driver behind the kind of new Islamic state model. And one thing he talks about is that in a lot of is a lot of the heavily Islamic countries, in part actually because of the history of, of fairly authoritarian regimes, so nothing directly to do with Islam in those countries, more to do with, with their post-colonial history, there isn't a well-developed civil society the way that there is in the U.S. These things are emerging, but you know, authoritarian regimes didn't encourage the development of um, organized groups that were, even if not opposed, that were just sort of outside of the government's scope. And religious organizations have often been an exception to that. And as a result, um, 
religious organizations are often centers of criticism, opposition, resistance, questioning of governmental power. And they might do well in that form. Even in the US, we have a you know, we where we have a well developed civil society, there's a strong strand of focus on specifically religious civil society. So Bush era Office of Faith Based Initiatives. There's a general positive attitude in the US towards all sorts of religious groups as part of civil society, often with an explicit spin of these being an alternative to government. Even if not directly in opposition, a sort of counterbalance, a different source of power than the government. Um, so, you know, you'll have many conservatives who may not be huge fans of the government giving money to the poor, who are supportive of things like church soup kitchens uh, providing services to the poor. Uh, and the idea would be that you want to have other ways for people to get the things they need besides being dependent on be, being dependent on the government. So religious organizations are often seen as fulfilling this sort of role. And even though a lot of this could be done in principle by secular organizations, there are a lot of folks that think religious organizations are likely to be more stable, more cohesive, precisely because they provide a kind of identity constituting function that secular organizations don't, right? And there's some empirical evidence that this may very well be true, right? It's really hard to get people to be as invested in whatever, you know, Amnesty International or your local bowling league or your community organization as people are in their churches. Um, so there might be something that is not maybe inherently conceptually special about religion, but because religion tends to be a center of identity for so many people, religious organizations um, might have a special role to play in being nuclei of checks on the state, of alternative sources of power and, 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 and influence to the state. So, if there are advantages, you might wonder, well, can we reconcile democratic and religious values? In some sense, the three strategies I outlined towards the beginning are versions of this, but there might be, uh, those are really ways of trying to organize society given that religion and democracy are understood as, as somewhat separate. There might be ways of reconciling things on a deeper level, and some theorists have tried to think this through. So one option, and this is a kind of separation theory, though it's it's a little bit different than the way we do it here. One option is to give religion sway in some private sphere of policy. So in the US, for instance, the main way we give this sway is in the purely private sphere, personal associations. But there might be other ways of expanding it into the more public realm while still keeping it in kind of its own proper sphere. This is the way that India deals with um, at least some of its religions that, that Nussbaum is describing. So in India, there is public law that governs most things, but then for family law, you are governed by courts, key, at least if you're, if you're, um, uh, if, if you are a Hindu or a Muslim, you're governed by specific courts keyed to your religious values. So if you get a divorce in India and you are a Muslim, you are governed by Muslim law. If you commit a murder in India, you're governed by general law. But within the sphere of family law, there's a special role for religious law. We might give religion a special role in education, right? Uh, right now in the U.S., we, we are a little bit ambiguous on this, but lots of folks who don't otherwise really want to see a big public role for religion don't see a problem with um, government funds going to parochial schools, right, through something like a voucher system. Uh, or even with allowing people to opt their children out of public school for religious schools, 
because education is, is seen as an area where religion might have a more legitimate role to play than in some other areas of life. So one way is either through a sort of full-blooded separation theory um, where you keep re religion out of anything public or through a more mixed system like India's, give religion its own proper sphere to say some things are Caesar's and some things are not. Um, religion has its own turf to play on. A different way, or a different aspect, really, uh, that we, we've talked about already is part of the, often part of the separation thing, which is allow religious exceptions to some laws. And here you get the which ones question. And we probably should talk about that in class, because it's a big question. One that's interesting, and this is Nussbaum's suggestion, is that we keep religion, but we interpret religions in accord with public reason. So Nussbaum has this really interesting discussion where she says, well, look, maybe the best way to understand it is to say, none of us know exactly what was in the mind of God or, you know, whatever God analog is in your religion. But we know that we're not getting that directly, typically. Some of you may be prophets, I don't know, but most of us are not getting that directly. We're getting it through various things that have been transcribed by humans and this sort of thing. Um, so Nussbaum says, we should maybe say, our best guess as to what God wants out of us is our best guess as to morality. So if there's anything in the texts or in the statements of religious leaders that seems to go against morality as we best understand it, we should assume that God got it right and the text got it wrong. So she talks about the, uh, in, in the piece that I give you to read, she talks about um, the treatment of women in the, uh, in the Indian Muslim courts, which she takes to be immoral. It doesn't give women a lot of rights. And what she basically wants to say is, look, we should look at these things and say, clearly God doesn't hate women because we, we, you know, we understand for our public reason that uh, there's no reason they should be inferior. So it must be that the courts are getting it wrong. It's a really, as she points out, it's a really finicky strategy. Of course, we don't all agree on morality. Um, and it can seem especially problematic when it is a person outside the religion presuming to dictate what the religion means to someone inside of the religion, right? So... It might be one thing if you're if you are a Christian. It might be one thing for someone who is also a Christian and shares shares your religious uh, community to come up to you and say, "Look, I actually don't think that homosexuality is prohibited by Christianity." And you know, let me tell you why. Let me tell you about the parts of the scriptures that I don't think support this, or the parts of the scripture that I think that are are, are being misinterpreted or were inserted by people but don't reflect what what God wanted or whatever right it be it for a lot of people it would be a very different thing for me a non-christian to come up to you and say look I don't think Christianity really bans homosexuality because I you know I think you're I think you are getting your religion wrong it's a very different dynamic and especially if we're going to incorporate this into policy it's hard to escape that dynamic but it's an interesting kind of strategy to basically say that um, we ought to interpret religion in terms of our best public ideas about morality rather than uh, make it a constraint on our best public ideas about morality. And it might be, if it worked, it might be a very deep way of being able to reconcile uh, democratic values with, with religious ones. If we believe that democracy is, in at least some form of democracy, is the morally best way of running uh, a government, you can say, it can't possibly be in a be in conflict with religion because God would want us to run the government in the morally best way. So, if he seems, to, if anywhere in the text God seems to be saying that that democracy is not good, we must be getting the text wrong. All right, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice, which means that it is time to sum this up. So, basic issues: religious values and democratic values often seem to be in tension. But they may also be mutually supportive, so it may be worth trying to resolve that tension. There are a number of different ways people have taken uh, in terms of designing polities to try to resolve that tension. It's often an ever-evolving uh, mutual accommodation. Uh, I've laid out 
what I take to be three kinds of families of approach, separation, secularism, and religious constitutionalism. Um, there's lots of variations on this, and there's plenty of room for argument about who's, how exactly we should understand things. Um, and for you guys, one of the big issues, the most pressing issues for policy is that it's hard to draw the right line around protecting religious freedom on the one hand and passing laws that are in the general interest on the other because the bottom line is that the private sphere and the public sphere are often very close to each other um, and people's religious views don't apply nicely and neatly only to the parts that you want to consider private when you're passing when you're passing your policies